Okay, I think we're about ready. It's maybe a little minute early. I will be calling to order public meeting number 41 on December 12, 2012, uh, for the purpose of reviewing another set of key policy questions, um, if time permits. Um, before I start, any comments? Any anybody? Any suggestions, ideas, questions about how we proceed? In order? No, the way we okay. did yesterday was okay. whatever way you choose. Great. Fine. Okay. Uh, all right. Then let's just jump right into it. First on the agenda is key policy question number three, which was assigned to me. Um, the key policy question was, what criteria will we use to decide which, quote, not-for-profit or municipally owned performance venues, close quote, are, quote, impacted live entertainment venues within the statute's meeting? Um, as I said in the memo, this there is a lot of discussion about this issue in the statute. It's a fairly uh, specific and complicated process of determining how a live entertainment venue that's covered becomes uh, an impacted live entertainment venue. Um, and I, I lifted the statutes, the relevant statutes, from two of the <coughs> submissions from uh, SSR, Suffolk, uh, Sterling Suffolk, and from Mass Cultural Council. Um, but basically, it seems to me that what it boils down to is this, and I'll use my language, and if, I, if anybody thinks I've misrepresented it, please say so. But one part in one part of the, of the legislation precludes the possibility of a of a licensed of a licensee having a facility which basically seats between a thousand and thirty five hundred. So, this is fundamentally designed to protect uh, regional theaters, re regional entertainment venues that would hold about a thousand to thirty five hundred people. That's number one. Um, number two, the process that is specified is that the applicant should reach out to any live entertainment area in what they perceive as their area, their, their region, um, and discuss with those entertainment uh, ent venues whether or not they can mutually agree that they are, in fact, an impacted live entertainment venue, um, and then negotiate with that party. And if they do not successfully negotiate with that party and there is a, there is a venue that uh, feels like it should be an impacted live entertainment venue but which has not come to an agreement with the applicant, we can then direct them to negotiate for 30 days after, there's some, after we've re reviewed their whole license. Uh, we can determine one, wh whether we think, whether or not we think a live entertainment venue in fact should be considered impacted live entertainment venue and direct the applicant to negotiate with them for 30 days. Uh, if they can't agree after 30 days, then we are directed to develop, quote, protocols and procedures, close quote, that will ensure the conclusion of a, quote, fair and reasonable agreement between the parties. Um, I've listed the comments. Sterling Suffolk basically said you should focus on the, we should focus on the protocols and procedures, which is we are mandated to do and leave the idea of specific criteria, which is the question we're addressing now, um, to the parties because such determinations are, as Suffolk, Ster Sterling Suffolk said, very fact-intensive and it's hard to generalize principles. Paul Vignoli said we should use the mileage from the casino as the standard. Brown Rudrick, representing MGM Springfield, said the key issue is a reasonable proximity to a casino with a, quote, like-sized venue, Springfield, which is shouldn't be the case because like-sized venues tend to be uh, uh, ignored, uh, um, prohibited. Uh, but it went on to say specifically that in terms of what is reasonable proximity, that if a casino in <coughs> Springfield should not have to consider any live entertainment venue in Greater Boston, for example, as proximate. Uh, Martha Robinson said we should use tax <coughs> status to determine nonprofit and munis municipal. I think she under misunderstood the question. Alex Feinstein mm -hmm. said uh, anything within 20 miles. Shevsky and Freilich in the city of Springfield said that the thing to do would be for the developers to consult with the host communities who would have the best knowledge about impacted venues. MAPC said the venue should be within a, quote, reasonable market area with more than, quote, minimal impact especially of similar size and type to the venue in the casino. 
and Mass Cultural Council and Mass Performing Arts Coalition were very prescriptive, specifically said, yes, we should say that if you have more than a thousand seats, if you have operation with a radius of a hundred miles from a gaming establishment, and if you have performances of live music, concerts, comedy, variety shows, or touring Broadway or theatrical shows, those would be the criteria that we would use to, to identify a, quote, impacted live entertainment venue. As I understand it, having talked to f people and having uh, read all the comments and the submissions going back prior to this, because Commissioner Stebbins and I met with, with the uh, Mass Performing Arts Coalition and Mass Cultural Council uh, way back, Basically, the issue is not that, which is the intuitive issue, is that you think they'd be afraid that, they'd, that the casinos, entertainment venues will steal their audience. That's not the problem. That's an issue, but it's really not the issue. The issue is afraid that the casinos will negotiate performance deals with major draws, major performers, um, be able to pay them more money because they don't live on the, on the ticket revenue, they live on the gambling revenue, and, and negotiate uh, exclusivity agreements in effect that says this particular uh, entity, entertainment entity, will not uh, perform within a prescribed area uh, for a long period of time. And they, I'm, we have been told, and I have no independent data on this, that, that it tends to be 100 miles or so, tend to be a pretty wide range. So uh, the issue is not losing so much losing the audience, it's losing the prime entertainment draws that they would like to sign up. Um, so as I, I said here that I look forward to further comment on this from everybody involved. It's a, it's a complicated, it's not so much complicated, just a very nuanced issue, very much a function of people who really <coughs> understand the entertainment business. Um, but uh, that on a tentative basis, I recommend the following. Uh, one, that we do not enumerate specific criteria for determining which live entertainment venues are impacted live entertainment venues. I think that it probably will need to be a pretty careful case-by-case -case analysis. Um, but I also recommend, item two, that we issue an advisory that we will consider certain criteria in the event that we need to determine which venues are impacted. The most important one that we would consider is the relationship between the location of the venue in question and the geographic <coughs> scope of the exclusivity clauses that the applicant uses, whether oral or written, when they book performances. Um, so people, sh we would say up front that this is something we would consider in the event that we have to make a determination. Um, and secondly, and this is more obvious, whether the venue presents um, performances of live music, comedy, or var variety performers of touring Broadway or theatrical shows. So we, we would use a pretty broad brush of the kind of entertainment vehicles. <coughs> I think the advisory should further encourage our applicants proactively to, from us to be sure they reach out and try to negotiate uh, uh, arrangements with impacted live entertainment venues because the prob the loss of time if they don't, and if we identify an impacted live entertainment venue and compel them to have at least a one stage and possibly a two stage process, um, will be deleterious to the, to the speed of the licensing process. So it's in their interest to resolve these issues as quick uh, up front if they can. And then I'm taking a flyer on the third one, um, recommending what protocols and procedures are for uh, forcing a reconciliation in the event that they can't negotiate an agreement after the first 30 days, it seemed to me, at first I was starting to think, well, you know, some kind of elaborate metrics about performance or something or other, but it seemed to me that the easiest way to go here would just be to come up with a standard arbitration process. You know, each side, each side appoints an arbitrator, the two arbitrators appoint a third, and the three arbitrators together come up with a binding agreement, the cost of the arbitration would be paid by the applicant. Um, so that's my considered opinion until I get contradicted with a better one. Do, do we know if anyone else uses that arbitration method? 
lots of people use that arbitration method for all kinds of arbitration, well, but I don't know. In the casino industry. I, I don't know. Thank you. One, one of the documents I think referred to, one of the comments somewhere referred to that there may be some kind of dispute resolution process um, in the legislation that would bear, that would weigh here. I didn't, I don't, I didn't get that. I didn't find that, but that's, somebody else may have a better view of me. I don't know whether other people have that or not. Other people use that. Do you, do you guys know? Does anybody use that kind of a process for something for this kind of a similar dispute? A ADR is sometimes used. You know, alternative dispute resolution as a means of uh, expedited uh, arbitration mediation right. uh, mediation type. But ADR issues. can be just that could be one person and who comes exactly. in, or it could be a, exactly. it could be this U point one, we point one. It can be any kind of structure. Right. It's very flexible. It just means not right. going to court, basically. Right. Anything right. the parties agree to. Right. right. In the casino. This, this, uh, Mr. Chairman, has the approach of being a, a, a functional approach. The, the only uh, thing that I th was thinking about as I read this uh, is the desirability of having the uh, applicant and the impacted and, and the entertainment venue determine up front so they don't uh, 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 who was. Uh, uh, an impacted live entertainment venue. And if we limit ourselves simply to a case-by-case -case approach, um, then it's going to be difficult uh, for the applicant to figure out up front, and for the entertainment venue, I suppose, to figure out up front whether they're, they're a, an impacted venue. Uh, what about if we took the basic uh, uh, functional approach that you've taken, but just say, uh, but just add uh, a criterion, something along the lines of if uh, the you, the applicant, plan to use an exclusivity agreement, um, then any entertainment venue uh, within the exclusivity um, area, uh, the commission will consider a li an impacted uh, live entertainment venue. Because it's the it's the it's the exclusivity agreements that really lie, as you point out in this, uh, that lie at the heart of this, or that the commission will presumptively consider any entertainment venue within the exclusivity area to be an impacted live entertainment venue. So you're saying, give, you're, you would put that. You're talking about making that a reg, making that a. a a, a rule as opposed to an advisory yes and stating it a little more affirmatively and stating it more affirmatively to give everybody clear notice that that's what we believe is at the heart of this and as a practical matter that's going to be our starting point maybe it can be overcome but that's at least going to be the starting point I, I'm I would be pretty much fine with that there's a there's a question that was raised in some of the comments I think if I'm if I'm remembering this right that and the law is pretty clear that we don't make the impacted decision until after we have assessed right. the entire op application. Right. So it suggests that the law imagined that we need, you know, we need the context before we weigh in. Um, so I was, I was thinking rather than run the risk of running afoul of that intent, that we just, I think if we stated it, maybe we even state it more clearly, advisory would be we're uh, presuming or some, somehow so I was trying to get the message out there that this is clearly going to be critical without potentially running afoul of speaking too soon in the process. And I'm, I'm not, I don't have a strong enough opinion or knowledge about what, whether we really would be precluded from um, making this, the, the statement as strong as you're suggesting. I'm, I'm a little uh, troubled and we could get an opinion as to whether we could issue an advisory as opposed to a regulation and then act on it. Um, because you have to go through that public process for a regulation. And, but, but we can figure that out. The point is that, that uh, if, this, if, if the uh, exclusivity provision lies at the heart of the problem, as it does, then it seems to me worthwhile to tell everybody that we see this at the heart of the problem and that that's going to be a key focus of our inquiry if you don't figure out what your agreement is. That allows them to make an agreement. The, the other alternative I had was to 
was more draconian, and that is to issue a regulation banning exclusivity agreements. I'm not sure we have the power to do that. So, uh, <coughs> well, the other the other thing is that we, there's probably an argument on the other side. If I were if I were, you know, if I were running the casino entertainment venue, I'm sure they would have some rebuttal to what the may, I would think they probably have a rebuttal. So. Um, all I really know is one side of the story. I mean, nobody, nobody testified um, on this particular point from the other side. Well, yes, but I understand that. But the, but the, the lie, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily dictate what the result is. It simply says that you've got to figure out if, they're, the if they're within that. Then you must have. You must they talk are to impacted. them. They are impacted. Right. Now they may be impacted greatly. They may be impacted not very much. But at least you've got to get together and have a mitigation agreement. It may be, uh, it may not be uh, all that onerous. Um, uh, there are a variety of things. But at least you, you, this is a heads up that you you need to consider these people, uh, or these entities. Uh, if 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 we could if we could make a strong statement that that's what we consider to. Um, that's a key consideration in determining who a live, uh, 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 an impacted live entertainment venue is, then I'd be happy with that. I'm just not, and we could get an opinion on that. I'm sorry, say, say again? In other words, if we, if we could issue an advisory, a, a policy, which is what it basically would be, and, and then act on it without formally making a recommendation, I'd be prepared to go that way. I'm not sure we can do that. But What, what about the other advisories that were? Issuing up, how does it differ? Well, I don't, I don't know that we've issued other <coughs> advisories of of this type that that bear on something that we're going to act on in the licensing process. We have an opinion from we have an opinion from and uh, from uh, council now that talks about the diff. Well, it's not really an opinion; it's a it's a sort of a white paper that talks about the difference between policies, what we can do by policy and what we have to do by regulation. Um, Mass Massachusetts decisions um, uh, are pretty heavily on the side of policies being restricted to internal operating procedures as opposed to procedures that affect the outside world. And uh, I just don't know where yeah, this okay. falls in that. Um, I, I have a question. Um, whether we issued a policy advice, uh, an advisory, or a regulation, the determination of impacted venue uh, could and likely will come in the future, not not at that time. Is that uh, is that correct? Uh, the, the the idea uh, uh, that that we're uh, pondering that right now is that there would be a rule for us to at any time after that rule promulgation. To determine, based on whatever evidence we we see, um, to determine whether um, a municipally or uh, owned uh, venue has been impacted. Yeah, as as, as uh, Chairman Crosby described, uh, we determine we, we if necessary determine what is a live in, uh, 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 an impacted live entertainment venue after we get the application and look at all the facts. The issue here is how do we incentivize the applicant and potential live entertainment venues to come to some kind of an agreement before they file the license so they can file that agreement with the license. We're going to have the same issue when we come to surrounding communities. I mean, it's right. the same issue. Mm -hmm. it's, the same, it's the same formula. And so the question is how do we incentivize that agreement up front? One way to incentivize that agreement up front is to lay out the criteria that we're going to use, and I agree that it's a, in, in the main, it's a fact-bound inquiry, except that at the heart of it is something that is, it would seem, not so much a fact-bound uh, uh, inquiry or at least a fact that's easily determinable. If you're going to uh, have an exclusivity agreement that's going to knock a performer who you otherwise would be able to hire out of your venue, then you have been impacted. Uh, and so, uh, uh, presumptively at least, uh, that is something that we would look carefully at in determining what was an impacted live entertainment venue. And 
somehow forcefully uh, we ought to state that up front right. so that I, but I think to your point though this it's very this would be one place where it'd be very important that we have an ongoing reg that's very clear because if somebody says we're not going to and three years later we're, they, they are then we need we would reopen this question for sure so right. that would be very important right. I think if, if we could do the word presumptively, I, I'm, I think it would, I wouldn't quite agree with saying absolutely as a matter of fact, if you use these, right. that you are impacted. I, I agree. Okay, so I agree. If, we could get, if we could get presumptively in there, if we have to do it as a reg, we have to do it as a reg. If we can do it as an advisory, we'll do it as an advisory. Um, but um, I, would, I would agree with that. Just so it, it makes this a little stronger than I had written it, but doesn't make it absolute. Right. right. Um, so, should uh, is there other other discussion on that? Um, go ahead. I, well, I just have a quick. I mean, we're only talking. Sorry, I can't recall the number. We're only talking about not-for-profit or municipally owned performance venues. Right. I can't nine, recall, nine but ten. I can't imagine it's a nine or big ten. number. Yep. Um, it's like eight or ten yep. that are in a part that are part of this right. nine or ten yep. coalition. Yeah. It's, I mean, it would appear to me if I was an applicant, I would try to come before this commission having talked to eight people, eight to ten people, and essentially trying to do as much, getting back to the judge's point of how do we, how do we incentivize this conversation and these agreements to already happen. I mean, it's, it's eight to ten. I don't think any operator would want to have to be in a position of three years down the line of trying to get <coughs> XYZ Act in here and you know, then a regulation kind of kicks in at a later date. But I don't know exactly what we would, I guess the incentive is avoid the frustration later and try to work it out with eight to ten entities. It just well, doesn't seem to be that many people. But. That, that might know. be. On the other hand, uh, somebody who's separated by 90 miles from the entertainment venue may say, you know, come on, unless yeah. we say that the criterion is not geographical, it's not the audience draw, it right. is, it the is the exclusivity, right? And that's that would be, that would be something that if we went this route would clarify that. So that everybody know. Yeah, I, th I think we need to state whatever way is is um, whether by policy or, or regulation that we understand that the issue here is those exclusivity clauses, which are on the supply side, not necessarily on the geographic side. Mm -hmm. All right. But I. Okay. Other. Um, the only other th thing is minor, uh, Mr. Chairman, and that is in the in the uh, protocol and procedures uh, point. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, uh, we have the uh, other two. We have each side appointing one arbit uh, one arbitrator, and the uh, those two appointing a third. If they can't do it right away, we ought to leave it open for the commission to to do it, so they don't fool around for two weeks, not being able to agree on a third. On the third. Yeah. Isn't that, that isn't that their problem? I mean, why do we care? I mean, if the, if the applicant, or if you, I suppose the 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 the, insta, the uh, entity, the entity's representative could stall just for the sake of stalling. Um, maybe it's not a problem. Yeah. Uh, it just seems to me that 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 uh, we we avoid the possibility of dragging out the process even further. But the well, suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, then I think, um, let me frame it the way I think this has been amended, and then some, maybe somebody can so move. But the, I think we would have a motion that um, we accept the recommendations <coughs> as written with the amendment that uh, we will uh, make the statement that presumptively in the event that we have to weigh in on a whether or not a, com a venue is impacted we would um, uh, conclude that it is if it's within a uh, geographic pro uh, exclusivity region um, but it's a rebuttable presumption 
um, and then and that we will try to implement the uh, recommendations that come under the advisory in an advisory if we can and if not we will do it via regulations All right do you want to so move commissioner so move <laughs> all right second all right any further discussion on that one um, I didn't so does that the uh, you, I guess the fact that nobody's objected, particularly you, that this is as good a as good a protocol or procedure yes. as anything else. Okay. Yeah. All right. So all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed. The ayes have it. Okay. Um, key policy question number four, which is Commissioner Cameron. Forty. Correct. Sorry, forty. 40? Yeah. Okay. Should the commission prescribe the games, rules, and controls a licensee may have, or should it solicit proposals from applicants <coughs> or licensees? Uh, legislation does not speak to this issue directly. Our strategic plan does. Um, pages 158 through 163, we talk about uh, dividing the rules into two categories, integrity-based rules that apply to all games and game specific rules regulating how the games are played. Uh, I just listed out some of the pros and cons. So when we're talking about the regulator uh, saying this is how the games will be played, it, it is a standardized process. Um, it genuinely, genuinely provides less, less flexibility to the operators. Uh, it assists the regulators in the oversight of the gameplay. Everything's equal. They understand the rules. Uh, it eliminates training regulators on the differences in rules among casino operators. Fewer uh, patron disputes because they understand the rules were played the same way at every facility in the Commonwealth. Um, it um, may require, if it's a regulation, though, it may require more time to amend when changes are necessary. Um, on the con side, rather the pros for letting the operator make the rules and then of course the, the regulator would, would say yes, we agree and we're going to allow you to do it that way. Um, it may lack some consistency you know, in, in the play, the payouts, the wagers, but at the same token it allows for diversity and game options offered to players. Uh, there could be higher incidence of patron disputes. Uh, it may result in a competitive advantage to one or more casino operators, resulting in different odds. Uh, again, we get back to the training of the regulators. Um, and it may expedite rule changes. Um, whichever way we choose to go, by the way, um, obviously we would still maintain control for an evaluation of compliance. We would review the manufacturer's specifications for game equipment, uh, you know, the payout schedule, the calculation, the table layout, number of decks, all of those things. And of course, a, a laboratory would take a look at all this uh, before we, we gave our approval. Um, there was only one public comment on this, and I was actually surprised that Sterling Suffolk uh, was in favor of consistent across the board um, way of doing things. In other words, the regulator makes that decision. I did sit at a meeting out in Las Vegas and listen to gaming operators who are, who are very much in favor of allowing the flexibility, allowing the individual casinos to have some flexibility which actually may bring patrons to their facility over another because they like the way the games are being played at that facility. So those are two differing comments. Um, our gaming consultants are split on this one. They, they don't have a firm recommendation for us, which is mm. unusual. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. It really is a question of, and jurisdictions that we've looked at are split. New Jersey, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Delaware, all standardized rules by the regulator. Um, on the other hand, uh, Ohio, Illinois, uh, Iowa, Louisiana allow the casino operators to develop the game rules subject to approval by the regulator. So having, you know, heard all of this, now I'm looking at those bigger jurisdictions, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, we're up to 11 facilities now. Certainly that would be a little more difficult 
for the regulator to really understand a, a different set of rules in every facility. Now here we're looking at three juris three in three distinct regions of the state. Frankly, the, the four, four uh, because it would have to do with slots too. Right? Correct, but most of this that we're talking about are table games. Oh, okay. The different rules. So, you know, our regulators are our folks out at those casinos probably will not be traveling from facility to facility. They would be in the one facility because of the distance between them, most likely. So I don't think we'd have the same training issues that they do in other jurisdictions. And I know, um, <coughs> you know, one of the main thrusts here with the, with the legislation was to allow for economic development. And that is one of the advantages to letting the um, operators have some say in the way business is done. So if we keep that in mind, and the fact that we are juris, uh, rather our regional uh, locations should not uh, really be a problem for regulators to understand the rules in those facilities, I think at this point I'm leaning towards, and I didn't clearly state this, by the way, and I said we need to discuss it. But I, I think I'm leaning toward looking at letting the uh, operators have a say in this, you know, be able to, to give us uh, some, uh, some ideas of things that they would like to do. And of course, we maintain control. We'll be looking at all the appropriate uh, calculations and layouts, and uh, they've all been tested in a lab. So um, that, that was my summary of what others do and the decision we have before us. But again, again, I think I, I looking at the uh, the regional approach that we've taken here, and the flexibility which can allow for some com competitive. Some can would you, say a competitive can, advantage. Can you give examples? Give some more examples of the of rules. What what are we talking about? We're talking about a kind of card game. For example, in Atlantic City, poker is prescribed a certain way, or you know, it has to be played this many cards. These are the rules where there are so many variations now on different games. Um, like you can each, well, each side game. Side well, you can hit on a soft 17, you don't hit on a soft 17. Okay. There's, uh, you can uh, craps, you offer dub double odds or triple odds, or to be able to do the kinds of uh, advantageous marketing techniques that can be adapted to, uh, to the rules of the games. There are casinos, as Commissioner Cameron said, there were some casinos in, in Massachusetts will offer entirely different games than other casinos do. Uh, there's no prescription in the statute that says you have to have blackjack and then you have to have roulette. You have, so they could, they, there are all kinds of game developers now who come in with a, a new type of game and one casino may have it, one casino may not. So the idea that rules of games that everybody has might be different are, we're, we're represent the Section of the consultants that think that that's not such a bad thing, uh, that it wouldn't be so Flex hard. Flexibility is not such a bad thing. What's think, the difference? I'm sorry. We think Commissioner Cameron's right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, what, what's the difference between an integrity uh, based rule? Uh, uh, applicable to all games and a game specific. I understand a game specific. Yeah, That's I mean, the there, there needs to be you know flexibility, and all states have flexibility, even the ones that have rules of the games. Uh, in their words, the casino would tell you if they want to use eight decks or six decks or four decks. That's purely discretionary. But we have found in the past that it helps to have, at least in the beginning, a, a, a standard format so that everybody's on the same page. The regulators, the state police. Uh, identifying <coughs> collusion or identifying some of the crimes that typically take place in the casinos requires that the regulators have a in-depth knowledge of the games or you're totally dependent on the casino to tell you that and we think it should be you need your own independent capability uh, what we've recommended in some of these other jurisdictions are start with some of these rules and provide as much flexibility to the operators as possible and then revisit that issue a couple years down the road once the regulators are trained and once um, you know uh, the casinos are operating here and kind of balance it in that way. This is something that can and should, in our opinion, in every jurisdication be revisited. I mean, what, what was it? What was it? The rules would be something like if when a dealer leaves a table, they have to show their hands to the camera. That would be something that uniformly everybody should do. 
uh, for the integrity county, purposes. The accounting house, they have to show the empty box. Yeah. Right. Minimum, minimum, minimum staffing, staffing, for example, right. you know, those type of things that would be. Uh, no, we're, we're not suggesting yeah. minimum staffing. No, no, no but I'm but saying. We're those they're talking about just rules of the game. But you're not, so you're, it sounds like. Are you both in agreement on on integrity yes. rules? Yes. Yes. They should be yes. the, the same. Yes. But on these kind of play rules, yeah. is right. game variations. Uh, right. The commission won't be able really even to think of all the variations that can be played in a game. Let the casino decide right. if they, if they if not without your approval ultimately. That say, okay, we looked at this and this works. Yeah. But uh, they, uh, yeah. they're more in on the side of flexibility. And, and roulette players will, will gravitate towards a roulette table that has a single zero instead of a double and a triple zero, for example. Craps players will be looking, like Guy pointed out, triple odds on craps, you know, different things like that. And those are the kind of things that the operator will evaluate in putting out his selection of table games uh, based on what he thinks the particular uh, demographic will, will uh, be most attractive. And, and when we're not disputing that. We agree with that. They, the operator, you should have some broad rules and then the operator tells you what they want to do, and then you accept it. And if they want to change it, they tell you what that change will be. Uh, one quick point, though, I, and uh, Guy and Bob make the point about odds at craps. Uh, that does not necessarily, you can have uh, industry wide rules, but still allow some flexibility. In Atlantic City, for example, a casino can offer up to, say, 10 times odds on craps. They don't have to, they could offer five times odds. So there is flexibility within that arrangement. What, what do, what do uh, we make of the fact that we only got one comment? That comment was from an industry person, and that comment favored uniformity. Do we place any well, weight on that? Uh, it's very different than what I heard in Las Vegas, which was, uh, which was um, many, many operators talking about the fact that they like that flexibility. That really helps them. And they have a new game. They want to be able to introduce it. It's how they feel like they can make the most money and keep the players interested. So it is it is different than what I heard at one of the many seminars out there. Yeah, but I mean, understand that. Casinos, I mean, the neighborhood casinos in Vegas, definitely that's 100% accurate. They want to be able to compete against the other neighborhood casinos by offering the different games. That's totally right. In a, you know, the counter is in the limited jurisdiction and. You know, Caesars and, and some of the big companies, they try to train their people because they transfer them from <coughs> jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And you may have a, um, a shift manager or a floor manager that operated in Indiana or elsewhere being interchanged here, you know, frequently. Is there, why, why is this question a, 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 a one that we need to answer now? You don't know. <coughs> you don't. Oh, okay. All right, that, that, all right. I I, um, I was going to pick up to on which we will be drafting the phase two regulations there. right and the phase two regulations <coughs> we want to do you want to do the slots first so there might be some rules regarding the slots that we would have to draft that you we would need your guidance in terms of whether or not you want them general or specific right the table games that can come later most of this yeah. involves table games anyway yes. I, I'm, f I'm f we can I'm fine to do it now if we can I'm just you know we started this out thinking there were certain kinds of questions like you know, what, what are we going to say about surrounding communities that we really had to have answers now so that the participants knew? Um, and then somehow we ended up with a bunch of other questions, many of which aren't really so time sensitive, but that's fine. Okay. Is the, it, on, the, on that point, though, is, is there any uh, reason uh, uh, to parse this question between table games and slot, uh, table game rules and slots rules? Slots are totally different. Uh, you might have electronic gaming on, uh, here to some degree because that's a growing you know, phenomenon on the industry, but that's handled um, with the same rules as the electronic gaming. It has to be random. It has to be, you know. It's so, so uniformity is necessary. Just by the nature of the beast, uniformity is necessary in slots? You can't you're gonna, have slots You're going to have rules. technical technical rules for the slot machines, which you, you'll either promulgate or adopt one of the a major a test labs. Yeah, uh, standards. There, there's two different aspects really the slots, I think, we look at. The, to the extent we're analogizing it to rules of a game on a table, yeah. the rules of a game on a slot machine are individual to each slot machine. Right. So you'll, they'll be submitted <coughs> to a lab, and the lab will test to make sure that the machine plays according to its own rules. Uh, and 
that, that, that is a little bit of a difference from a table game, which is not done by, by computer and is done by people, and they have to know what those particular rules are. Uh, but, and then a, but a slot machine's um, functionality uh, is it has to the tests for its functionality should be uniform so that everyone knows what has to be approved and what has to be reviewed and what has to be tested. So, so a, a, a <coughs> slot machine X in in uh, Casino A is going to function in exactly the same way as slot machine X in the uh, slots sorry. parlor. Well, it'll function the, the way its uh, computer brain tells it to function. It's yep. uh, the, every so if, if it com the same game in Casino A may have a 92 percent payout percentage, that same game in Casino B they may set to a 94 percent payout percentage. So every one of those games is tested in the lab to make sure that what its theoretical percentage is, what it's supposed to pay out, it will pay out. But the, and, and, the, and the rules of that game may be the same, the payout could be different. I mean, Can the rules be different? In other words, it'll pay out if you get, if you get a, a single the rules gold I think that irrelevant, irrelevant, really. It's the payout percentage. It's really, you say you have yeah. a 92 percent payout. You can pay so, more so, than that. So the, the so long and short of it is this conversation doesn't apply to slot machines. That's right. Really? It's not the, same payout. The, the, only re the only reason I thought we were potentially entertaining this question now is how much of this ability to offer the flexibility to establish my own games or follow the standard route, how much of that plays into uh, an operator's kind of planning model in terms of revenue, floor layout, anything like that. That's the only reason I thought this question might be germane to kind of the early stages of the regulations. <coughs> it, it could. I mean, it, de it depends. I mean, it, the, I think the more important issue is going to be the breakdown of games, which is going to be based on their demographics. For example, if they have Asian players, you're going to have a much higher uh, Baccarat uh, number of tables. Um, than you would have otherwise. If it's different segments go to different markets, the rules of the games theoretically could have an impact, and, and but not. I don't think they're material that no. much. Okay. They're not material. Okay. All right. So we could hold this until well, I think we're planning another uh, uh, policy discussion toward the end of January to talk about some of those number threes. Um, so this could be a question that we hold. If uh, you know, it, yeah. it just happened. It was on this list. It was, uh, I but, believe, yeah. at number two. They got moved up. And be interesting to hear from some of the other potential applicants. Yeah. For the for the record, um, my instinct is kind of the same as yours. You know, I sort of like you know the mm -hmm. sort of laissez faire. Let them figure out their own preferences. Right. And and these are these are going to be relatively far apart casinos. It's not going to be not like going to a place where there's your th you could go from mm -hmm. across the street and all of a sudden have to learn a new set of rules. Mm -hmm. Um, you're probably going to pretty much use one or the other of, of, of the facilities. And we could certainly, as you say, we could make a priority out of making sure that the, reg the regulatory presence was pretty much Properly. trained yeah. for, the, for the one facility. Uh, and I sort of like the idea, prefer the idea, I think, of letting people be flexible. I am puzzled, as Commissioner McHugh is, that you know the one operator who responded took the other position and the other ones didn't say anything. So maybe isn't such a hot, you know, maybe, they, maybe, obviously they don't care that much, at least the people, they just, they just the ones who were here. Positions. Yeah. I, I think that the piece about the consumer frustration or, you know, the angry customer, I, I think is somewhat limited over, as the chairman pointed out, you right. three, potentially four facilities, you're going to begin to feel the rules for each app, you know, each operator and right. choose well, where you want to go. For, for whatever it's worth, uh, I'll state for the record that I appreciate the, um, the, the, the viewpoint of uh, what may be safer uh, or, uh, or more desirable in startup mode, which is where we will find ourselves. And if consistency points to that uh, direction, I would, I would be inclined to, to err on that side. But um, I, I agree that we perhaps can table these and... Um, yeah, I don't see any. I don't see any reason to force a vote on this. If it's, I mean, I, I think we'll all be interested in other people's in, in other feedback if there is any. Um, um, so anybody here who's representing any industry players, you know, we'd love to know what your preference is on what your thoughts are on this issue. Okay. Um,
question number 32 was mine, and at one point this was a big one. Um, the policy question was, should the commission set a time limit or other rules addressing the tribal compact slash land and trust <coughs> issue in Region C? Uh, and while that was a, uh, an important question a while back and may become an important question again, since we have, subject to a one-week hearing period, uh, decided that we will go down this parallel track, we have intervened to stop the delay in Region C. So if we go forward with that next week, when we will vote formally on it, um, Region C will be a little behind, but it'll be like, you know, 30 to 60 days behind, which is not going to be material in the big picture. Um, and we will give everybody a chance for the, during the background period to stay in sync with the rest of the region. So we may have to revisit this issue, but um, Commissioner McHugh and I discussed it and I think agreed that there's no need for us to deal with this issue, with this issue at this stage of the game. Is that It right, is. That's, that's, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, question number one was my question, but I happily offloaded it on Ombudsman Ziemba. Uh, do you want to join us? Gave him easy. Yeah. Gave him an easy one, right. <laughs> <laughs> Way to see the others I gave him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think you have a benefit of a you know, probably too lengthy memo, but I'll, I'll try to summarize some of the provisions of that memo. Um, good. Um, before I get into some of the analysis, I, I'd like to just run through some of the comments that we've received because it's instructive of some of the some of the recommendations that I have in my memo. Um, for the general question is how will we define surrounding communities and should we publish that definition early in the process? We received, this is probably the number one issue that we received comments uh, on. Uh, Sterling Suffolk Racecourse said no, consistent with the testimony that you heard yesterday. Um, they mentioned that the statute provides the necessary factors and that we should first work on the protocols for resolving disputes and the protocols are similar to those ones that were just um, mentioned on the, um, on the previous question that we just discussed. Uh, Shevsky, Furlick, City of Springfield, um, they recommended that we should define the impacts, uh, but that we would take into account those impacts in the case-by-case -case determination after the application is submitted. Mass Audemont suggested that the definition should be broad enough to encompass communities with environmental, social, or economic impacts. Uh, Paul Vignoli recommended that, yes, we should further d define surrounding communities. Philip Cataldo also recommended that we should uh, move forward with those uh, further definition and we should use a telephone company definition. The M MAPC recommended that we move forward with a further definition of surrounding communities uh, and they recommended very specific criteria, uh, many of which are adopted in the, in the memorandum that, I, uh, that we have here, but they've been modified and I'll, I'll go over that in, in a minute. Uh, Town of Lakeville recommended uh, yes, we should, and they uh, recommended a standard of 10 miles or less. Town of Bridgewater, yes, uh, they recommended a series of 10 mile circles up to 50 miles where those communities within the uh, inner circle would be the most impacted and more likely to be a surrounding community. Who did that? Town of Bridgewater. Uh, Joshua Levin recommended 15 to 20 miles. Martha Robinson recommended a radius of miles or travel distance. Uh, Andrea Powers <coughs> recommended a similar thing regarding a short drive. The MMA recommended yes, uh, but it should be based on a demonstration of the impacts, traffic and environmental, public infrastructure, greater public safety demands and quality of life. Uh, and then we received a series of, of letters. Oh, let me just uh, mention the Foley Hoag. And then Foley Hoag uh, said that there's a statutory definition. Uh, they commended the commission on the discussion regarding the role of the RPAs in resolving disputes, especially establishing protocols and, excuse me, especially in regarding providing help in the letters of intent that are currently required under our regulation. Uh, so that uh, applicants and surrounding communities and host commuters can apply for technical assistance. Um, they state that the definition must be after submission of, uh, of the RFA 2 process, that it must be based on 
factors and presentation of evidence after the submission of the application. Um, I'll, I'll mention a number of comments that we received from different groupings of legislators from, from Cambridge, Medford, uh, and for Somerville. They were all uh, recommending that the commission take into account their particular communities. But they had you know, specific standards, and I think it bears, uh, bears reading. It's just a short paragraph that uh, would be of interest to the commission. Uh, in their third paragraph, they note, a simple calculation of distance from the casino, such as five or 10 miles, might be sufficient in some areas, but a more flexible definition would allow communities which believe they would be or have been affected to make their cases. We urge the commission to consider allowing communities to present evidence of potential impact to the commission, including possible effects of traffic, infrastructure, environment, and public safety in order to be regarded as a surrounding community. Following the opening of a casino, the actual impacts may be different, so communities should have the opportunity to present evidence of the actual impacts and be deemed a surrounding community. Uh, we would greatly appreciate your consideration. So, in regard to the recommendation, I think that there's generally a threshold question of whether or not the M MGC, the commission, should further define a surrounding communities. Uh, the issue of surrounding communities was a very significant one in the legislative debate. I think uh, it might be safe to say that it was probably uh, one of the issues that most legislators had a, a very distinct in interest in, and there was a, a numerous, numerous uh, amendments that were uh, provided uh, to the Act or proposed to the Act. We included a copy of that uh, within your packets. Um, although the Gaming Act requires uh, the Commission to promulgate numerous regulations pursuant to MGL Chapter 23K, Section 5. Um, this is not one of them. Um, instead, what the Gaming Act provides is that, that the Commission shall, excuse me, that the Commission shall identify which <coughs> communities shall be designated after, uh, uh, as the surrounding communities after a review of the entire application and in the in any independent evaluations. Um, that section further states that in making the determination that a community is a surrounding community, the Commission shall consider the detailed plan of construction submitted by the applicant, information received from the public, and factors which shall include but not be limited to population, infrastructure, and distance from the gaming establishment and political boundaries. Uh, given the, the factors and the fact that a decision shall not be made until after the application with all of the information is submitted to the Commission, um, it is doubtful that any statutory or regula regulatory definition could fully satisfy whether or not a community is a surrounding community. It really it, it seems as if the legislature uh, is asking the Commission to make a case-by-case -case determination of the applicability after the submission of all those, uh, of all those materials. So within that context, con context we are uh, faced with a number of different options, and I boil them into three basic categories. There's many more permutations, but the three options that I present to the Commission are uh, that the Commission has the option to rely just on the statutory factors um, in a case-by-case -case determination at the time of the review of the Phase two applications before the Commission, with no further guidance pr provided to the, to the applicants or to uh, hosts and surrounding communities. Option two is through a guideline or a regulation, further refine the statutory factors with examples of the type of impacts that taken together collectively would result in a presumption that one is a surrounding community. And then the third option is establish bright line tests through regulation prior to RFA 2 that would result in a surrounding community determination or even specifically determine which communities are surrounding communities to the sites of gaming facilities that have identified themselves in the phase one process. Um, the question of, uh, of what is a surrounding community is important not only for the purpose of the applications that must be submitted to the commission, but it also has uh, importance after casinos are, or gaming facilities are up and running. Uh, pursuant to the Act, communities can take advantage of uh, the community <coughs> mitigation funds that's provided in MGL Chapter 23K, Section 61. 
and whether or not a community is a surrounding community might have a bearing on whether or not you could ask, access the funds, which are rather significant, after, um, after a casino is operating. Um, the Act seems to indicate that that access to those funds is not strictly limited to communities that have been defined as surrounding communities in the application process. And in many ways, that is a, a really beneficial thing uh, because even though there is a tremendous amount of importance of being uh, designated a surrounding community in the application, at least it's not the end of the game for communities. If communities are experiencing difficulties in the future, there's a potential that they could go to the mitigation fund to get access to funds to identify those impacts. And um, uh, it's different, obviously, than, than uh, during the application phase or if you have a signed agreement with an applicant because you have to apply to the commission to get those funds and it's not an automatic. But the fact, if, if we make a determination that, um, uh, that communities can come to the fund after the fact, that may relieve some of, some of the anxiety out there. So I don't know if we wanted to discuss some of these, because this is a rather lengthy memo, uh, if we wanted to discuss some of these subparts first. I can go on if you'd like me to. Yeah. Um, so in regard to the three options that we presented, one which is just rely basically on the statutory factors, allow the applicants in the surrounding communities to appear before the commission. Number two, which is through a guideline or regulation, re refine the statutory factors with examples. And number three, the option is establish bright line tests. Uh, there's strength, strength and weaknesses of each one of those different options. Uh, option one, that places the most responsibility on the applicant to determine which communities are surrounding communities. Um, now, although on its face that might pre present an advantage to an applicant beca because one could argue that an applicant could avoid a lot of significant mitigation costs if they unduly restrict the definition of a surrounding community, there are consequences for that type of action. For example, uh, the, the Commission shall weigh uh, these types of issues on on how upset a surrounding community is and the level of, level of support or non-support in surrounding communities in the context of its evaluation of applications. And to the degree that uh, an applicant fails to address impacts at surrounding communities, um, it risks that being a, a factor that the Commission could weigh heavily in their review of the application. Um, also, applicants risk uh, potential delay in the review of their application if indeed they don't uh, identify surrounding communities properly. A as we were discussing earlier, there's a, there's a process by which the Commission, after the application is submitted, the Commission shall review uh, any dispute regarding the definition of a surrounding community uh, status. And at that time, the Commission will set aside a number of days, 30 days, to resolve that dispute and for the, the uh, groups to try to hammer out an agreement after the Commission has designated a community as a surrounding community. But then, even after the fact, there's a, a protocol and procedure whereby the Commission shall review, um, uh, if they can't reach an agreement, the status of, of their um, uh, negotiations and basically through maybe a procedure that was outlined earlier, uh, impose upon conditions uh, upon the different applicants um, if, if the parties are to proceed in an application. While, uh, while this option places a lot of responsibility on the uh, applicants, it is, it is obviously the least clear of the three options. Uh, in, in my travels and conversations across the Commonwealth with uh, with surrounding communities and with host communities, uh, there's a lot of, th this is probably the number one question of what is a surrounding community? Uh, is my community a surrounding community? Are you going to further define what is a surrounding community? Um, so in that regard, this option really does fail to provide much further guidance beyond the statutory factors. Now the statutory factors, there are a number of them, which, which I'll go over uh, one by one, and they do provide 
you know, some guidance to communities. If they, if we were to put out an advisory, you could laundry list the factors that exist in the statute and that um, communities are advised to weigh those factors when they're considering whether or not they are a surrounding community. But in, re but in reality, uh, they are a little bit more broad than provide really meaningful input to surrounding communities on, or excuse me, uh, on communities on whether or not they're surrounding communities. Uh, Option three, I'll go into option three because option two is uh, the recommended, or at least my recommended option. Option three, this relates to the bright line test. And uh, especially with this, with the broad range of impacts that, that are possible with surrounding communities, I, I think it is almost impossible to define a bright line test that would really define uh, what a community, whether or not a community is a surrounding community or not. Uh, in addition, it, a bright line test would seem to contravene the purposes of the statute whereby the commission shall weigh the factors after an application is submitted based on the full application and the uh, factors that would be pr provided by the applicant and or the surrounding community in the context of its review of designation. Um, it certainly would provide a lot of clarity to communities. It would relieve a lot of anxiety uh, in some regards of whether or not a community is a surrounding community so that the parties could go directly to negotiation. Uh, but then again, it could have very distinct impacts upon uh, applicants who <coughs> may in their planning stages have allocated only a certain amount towards uh, what, what they can give out for mitigation and if they go beyond that, maybe that might have an impact on whether or not they're able to proceed in their application phase. Uh, you, you know, one example of how we have to be very concerned about pre-operational uh, costs is the Ameristar situation where, according to the public reports, they backed out of their application primarily because of some of the upfront costs without ever even knowing that they, they would be able to go through uh, to the commission. It's a little bit different here, but pre-operational costs and um, a requirement that they have to negotiate with a number of different communities that they don't believe are truly impacted might have some uh, ramifications. So, uh, just I think unless anybody disagrees with me, I think when you get to your your recommendation, generalize about. I don't think you need to go through all. all yep. the other, I mean, I think we. <coughs> Just generalize as to the principle. I don't think we need to go through each one of the, the impacts. Great. So uh, I will give you just the broad categories of statutory factors. Um, under option two, what I recommend is that we break out each of the statutory factors that I mentioned a little bit earlier geographic proximity, impact on transportation infrastructure, development impact, and operational impact. And that we uh, come up with a list Population. of, excuse me, yeah, that's the one I can't really put my hands around, so I, sorry I missed that one, and population. <laughs> um, and that we list a number of different factors that the commission would consider when it is doing the evaluation during the phase two process. Uh, this goes back to some of the debate that we had a little bit earlier on whether or not the commission can uh, issue guidelines of the type of factors that it would consider at the time of that review rather than doing a regulation. And, and why I think that's important is uh, one, of, one of the, at least one of the considerations that we've received from the applicants is that we have to be wary of the timetable for us to promulgate regulations and how that may impact the local negotiation process. So if indeed we put out a regulation uh, that may come about in May or, or in June, there may be an attendant delay at the no local negotiation process because some communities may say, um, I really need to wait until those regulations are promulgated before we can really truly enter into negotiations. Whether or not that, it, that would actually happen, I'm, I'm not certain. Uh, if we provided guidance to communities of what we think should occur, perhaps they would, yeah, they would do it. It, um, it, but would, it would in effect be a guideline because we'd be saying here's the Here's what we're going to put in the reg. So correct. So that remains to be seen, but it's it's definitely a point worthy of consideration. <coughs> so geographic proximity, impact to transportation infrastructure, development impact, operational impact, and then population are all the statutory categories. And then you'll see 
um, broken down within each of those groups is a number of different factors that, that I'm recommending that we solicit input on. Uh, this is a, I think what we always anticipated was that we would put forward uh, a recommendation and that we would solicit uh, uh, public input and input from all the affected parties on the types of factors or the types of considerations that would go into the definition. And we, we've done our best to, excuse me, to have a, a fairly comprehensive and uh, inclusive list of the factors that the commission could consider. But certainly there might be more out there. Certainly the actual wording of these is subject to change. Um, and um, uh, I think the input of, of folks out there would definitely be very useful to the commission as we put forward an opinion. One, one, one uh, I'll, I'll just break out a couple of the factors that, uh, that I mentioned in the memo just because I didn't recommend one. Uh, and I did recommend another. From, from my earlier comments, from the comments that we received from the general public, uh, and, w and when you take a look at the legislative debate, there seems to be a focus on defining surrounding communities within the context of a certain mile away from a gaming facility or uh, miles away from a surrounding community. And uh, my recommendation is that it may be a little bit, I, I, I know when you're setting rules, especially with a concrete number, um, it's just inevitable that somebody may attack that as being arbitrary. But in this context, it may be very difficult to set a specific mileage minimum without being accused of being arbitrary. In the course of my research, I tried to go and see if there are any standards out there that would lead us to a conclusion of a certain mile mileage. I try to take a look at what the typical traffic impact studies would recommend of a certain mileage, and I was unable to really find anything. I, I talked to a number of different uh, entities and agencies to see if they had any input on that, and uh, I, I'm not saying that that's probably the end of the research, but at least I wasn't able to, to come up with anything uh, in the context of my review. The recommendation here is that instead of a specific mileage as the, as the example, um, that, that the commission would likely just utilize a common sense understanding that if you are closer, if you're within a mile, it's much more likely that you would experiencing, experience an impact than if you were 50 miles away. Uh, but within both of those extremes, I think that people could argue that they might be impacted. For example, like the live entertainment venues. Many of those uh, folks have, have said that even though we are 50 miles away, uh, we are directly impacted by, uh, by things that have happened at the casinos in Connecticut. Um, and within a mile away, I guess it's not uh, impossible that you might not experience very significant impacts. I think the bottom line of the whole analysis is that what the commission should take a look at is the true impacts or the objective impacts to the extent that they can be um, ascertained and projected. Again, everything, even the best traffic impact study is merely a prediction of the future. But to the extent that uh, uh, in determining surrounding communities, we take a look of the likely impacts based on reasonable evidence, I think that that is uh, probably the, the best that, that we could do at the time of the uh, review of the applications. Uh, the other, the one other factor that I did include uh, in the factors that we should put out to the world for comment was uh, proximity of residential areas and potential surrounding communities to gaming facilities. Um, so that's a little bit different from just proximity to the host community, shared border with the host community, or proximity to the gaming facility. But we split that out as, as a specific factor just because uh, it, it is a very common item for people to consider of how close uh, a facility, be it a, an industrial facility, a, um, a, a utility facility, how close that is to residential areas. Uh, this, I just, I do note that the legislature rejected amendments uh, in this in this regard, but it did seem like something that the commission might consider, um, even if it states it or if it doesn't, when it receives an application. Um, so I, I broke that out. So in sum, the recommendation is that the commission adopt uh, option two to provide further refinement of the types of impacts taken in their totality that would have an impact on whether or not the commission would determine a community to be a surrounding community after the commission uh, considers the RFA two. 
it, it would use these examples to organize its discussion at the time of the term determination. And that uh, because the, the answer to this question is easy to answer and that should we define it or publish a guideline early in the process? Absolutely. Uh, so the recommendation is that no later than January 2013, we publish this advisory of the types of factors that would be um, considered by the commission during that definition. After we had got comments. After we've got comments, but still get the, right. the full yeah. advisory out by January. Right. Um, a number of different communities are considering uh, mitigation agreements right now, and if we get something out within a matter of weeks, at least it is hoped that they would consider some of these some of these factors in there in their uh, calculations or conversations with surrounding communities. Okay, great, great job. Thank you, glad I passed it off to you. Um, you questions, ideas, suggestions? I also thought it was very well explained and uh, the rationale for your, your selection makes a lot of sense. Does this, this run, this does have in your, this has the same question that you were concerned about, right? Is this, couldn't, can we issue an advisory or would it have to be a reg? Uh, it does have the same uh, question, but here I, I think it would be advisable to issue a reg uh, because, exactly. because this, this is much more fact uh, intensive. We're not just talking about a single fact. And so whether we have the power to do it by an advisory or not, I, it seems to me we ought to do that by regulation. Uh, it seems to me that we, we are going to announce a policy now which will help people understand what the regulation is highly likely to mm -hmm. contain. Okay. We're going to ask for public comment on the policy and then we're going to take the policy supplemented by the comments to the next level which either would be applying it or publishing a regulation that we then apply and I prefer the for the latter yeah. because of Which the we can do with the other one as well, the live entertainment we, we thing. We absolutely can. We absolutely yeah. can. We can jump right. by that. Right. Right. I, and in terms of substance, I think this is very well thought out. And I think that, again, the, the issue is how do we incentivize the applicant and the uh, potential surrounding community to make that agreement early on? And the only way we can really do that is by telling both what kinds of factors we're going to take into account. And the functional factors that you've articulated, it seems to me, are at the heart of this. The only thing I might add um, uh, to that or, or would ask you about is uh, should we sort of overlay the specific factors on the breakout with uh, some uh, language to convey that um, the impacts uh, uh, we'll be looking for are those that are materially greater than those uh, that are generally experienced as a result of the casino. In other words, uh, it is conceivable that if a casino goes in region X, everybody within 50 miles around or 60 miles around is going to feel some increase in housing, say. But <coughs> that's true of everybody. But there's a level at which the housing impact is going to put a drain on community resources that's significantly greater than those felt by the general population. And it seems to me that's, that would be a useful thing for uh, people uh, to know in terms of eliminating some communities as uh, potential surrounding communities. Uh, also recognizing that, as you correctly pointed out, the Community Mitigation Fund is available uh, if it turns out that the uh, impact is greater than anticipated or greater than the community can handle, even though it's not a surrounding community. But it seems to me some effort ought to be made to differentiate the sort of general impact of, uh, of a casino uh, and the impacts that cause somebody to be, some entity to become a surrounding community. Um, I, I, the one point I will make in reaction to that, that, that's a very common sense um, approach that, that you recommend. But in regard to the issue of regulations versus guidelines, um, you see from the memo that I came down on the side of guidelines rather than regulations for a couple of reasons. For one, because of the time factor that I mentioned. But number two, because uh, as a scrivener, it's very, very difficult to define things with the precision that would be important 
to the commission when it when it reviews that like your your example just then it's it's a lot easier to 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 state that and then to actually put that down in a regulation that has to be um, has to be followed the approach that I was taking was that these are the types of factors that the Commission would consider at the time that it reviews the evidence that is before the Commission but it, it, it is not limited to those factors and how they are precisely written in the regulation and, and that's uh, that could be very limiting of the type of uh, factors that the Commission should really take a look at at the time that it reviews it. Well, this, this gets back to some, in some ways, to the discussion that we had yesterday, and that is how do we, ref, uh, how do we uh, confine our discretion in a way that allows the affected uh, uh, parties to know how we're going to exercise this broad range of discretion yeah. without uh, backing ourselves into some arbitrary corner. And it seems to me that one could write a regulation that says, uh, uh, in effect, if called upon to do so, the Commission will uh, define, in accordance with the statute, uh, surrounding communities. In, in defining and the surrounding communities, the Commission will consider the following factors, uh, uh, whether uh, it will consider the impact of the casino on um, such uh, things as uh, construction uh, traffic on uh, on uh, uh, these various things, and uh, will uh, determine whether those um, impacts are materially greater than those felt by the public at large. And then you have simply listed what you're going to look at. You haven't said how you're going to apply them, the weight you're going to give them, but you have given people a heads up as to what they have to come in prepared to show in order to, to uh, get themselves to find this the surrounding community, and, and that's helpful to both sides. But the way you just got through saying it, I thought would have sort of played into what you were concerned about. The, what you, I thought what you were, you were saying, you wanted to say, you, these are advisory, these are descriptive, these are the kinds of things, these are right. characteristic of what we will be looking at, Yes. typical of what we are, examples of what we're looking at. Yeah. But you were, you were trying very hard to make it just exemplary. Uh, Correct. Not something that we really were nailed to. Uh, and I don't know, I don't have an opinion whether a reg, you, you can use the exact same words in a reg. You can write a reg that says we will use these as examples and well, we'll consider we will look at other issues. Whether a reg is, is inherently any more rigid than a guideline, yeah. I don't have an well, opinion. Let me just give you one example. For example, <clears throat> um, if you look at four operational impact, uh, I put the word demonstrated impact on public e education. Um, and demonstrated, I put that word in there for a reason. I put that in because at the time that a, a casino is in the application phase, it may be very def difficult to, to demonstrate where the impacts will be found in surrounding communities. Um, we have some examples from, uh, from the Connecticut, Connecticut casinos where the impacts on housing were felt a couple of towns over <laughs> but at the time of the application it's merely a prediction of where those workers will find themselves and so we will have numerous housing studies that are part of the application but we don't necessarily know what so school does, systems will be that, impacted why does that mitigate for a guideline rather well than because the if <coughs> if the word demonstrated is part of the regulation then the fight before the Commission will have to be on whether or not it's demonstrated, how it's demonstrated. So it's the fight regarding the very specific words that are the focus uh, of the factors and not on that the Commission is putting forward a number of factors that in its common sense understanding everyone should consider. So at the time of the application, both the surrounding community and the uh, applicant will put forward all the evidence that they have but they're not constrained regarding, yeah. you know, the specific words that we put in the regulation that yeah. is promulgated in June. Okay. Well, then we use different words, it seems to me. It, 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 you know, you, 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 we, we can avoid those fights. There are ways to do that. Um, and, uh, but it seems to me that, that we ought to, with this one in particular, um, uh, uh, d deal with it. Um, with all the rigidity that's possible in order to 
uh, begin to close some of the uncertainty that surrounds this concept now in order to get people focused on what it is that's at stake uh, when they're uh, considering whether they're surrounding communities or not, whether both the applicant and the surrounding communities are. Otherwise, it seems to me we're going to, uh, if, we, if we don't do something that, that, that helps people reach those understandings, then we're going to get a bunch of disputes when the application is filed that we have to resolve, and then there's a 30-day period to whip out an agreement, and that is not a useful process for the applicant or the surrounding community. The, the, the fewer of those we can have in this process, the better off everybody is, it seems to me. I, I, I couldn't agree. I'm sorry. I know. I just wanted to, I could see gaming consultants agreeing, disagreeing, and I just thought I'd like to hear their perspective yeah, on this. Well, let me just go ahead, Mike. Um, a couple points. I think that uh, John's option two does, I, I would, is, is the clearest of them, and the bright line is just not going to be appear apparent. There's going to be a lot of unanticipated consequences as We're this. Sure. So, so at, at moving forward, I think that um, we, in addition to what John has suggested, and I think this can be done in the form of regulation, is that some of the things we've thought about to be considered would be that the, the burden as to uh, what is a surrounding community, what is not a surrounding community, should be on the community itself should have the burden of demonstrating that, in part because what we're talking about, we're talking about the impacts on surrounding communities, what we're really talking about are the negative impacts. There are going to be communities that may be impacted, and they may be in close proximity or they may be in distant proximity, but they may not be negatively impacted. <coughs> and so that, the yeah. burden would be, should be on the community to demonstrate that it needs to have this agreement in place in order to deal with the impacts. <coughs> Um, and another issue to be considered is that unlike host communities, uh, surrounding communities really have to be required to, or should be required to negotiate in good faith with an applicant. In the alternative, if they aren't required to negotiate in good faith and an uh, applicant is required to have surrounding community agreements in place, you're effectively giving these surrounding communities veto power over an application. So there would be a difference there between the surrounding community's role and host community role. That's a, that's in the statute too. I mean, the, the statute won't let them just say no. You can't. That's a, we get to that, or that's another one we will get yeah. to in a second. But what, what about the issue? If this is what you, what about the issue of whether this would be better accomplished in a guideline versus a reg? Does that? I think the um, identification of the objective criteria is good. I agree with Commissioner McHugh in that regard. Uh, and I think a regulation can be drafted that would allow for the Commission to retain the discretion to weight the particular criteria in whatever is the most appropriate fashion. But uh, the idea that some further clarification of the, the generalized uh, factors that the, the statute identifies uh, is a good thing. I mean, I think it, it, it helps the uh, uh, surrounding we're, communities we're, to assess their new chances. That, we're we're going to do that. I okay. think we've agreed on that. The only that there's a sort of a sub debate going on, which is is it? And we don't have to answer well, this at the moment. But is it better? The choice between the regulation and the guideline, I think, is, has been has been stated. I, I think the regulation does add a little heavier force to it, um, and I think you know it would be prudent not to uh, make it uh, so that there's an objective requirement that each factor has to be. Uh, uh, satisfied to the point that uh, the regulation becomes too constraining. I think it, but a regulation of the two, I and mean, we prefer precision if possible. Uh, it just seems to be. Uh, okay. And one thing I may have been said already, just to underline that these are going to be hotly contested issues. Uh, and a community that wants to be a surrounding community and isn't determined to be one uh, is not going to be very happy. Uh, and the likelihood of some challenge to that uh, is also uh, a distinct possibility. And to the extent that the commission can point to uh, its, it, it, it having uh, undergone all of the necessary procedural steps to have come to the conclusion it did is going to be helpful in the defense of its decision. And having a regulation, having the question of whether it should be a regulation or shouldn't be a regulation uh, should be avoided if at all possible, by having a regulation uh, and thereby not giving a challenger that argument in any appeal from any decision you make. Yeah, I agree.
agree that uh, with what Commissioner McHugh and the other consultants have said, this is a matter I believe is properly addressed through a regulation. But I just point out so it's out there on the table, it, it impacts on timing. While the uh, promulgation of a regulation is uh, on the Commonwealth's uh, procedures is going to take probably until <coughs> March or April to, or to, uh, to have it, you know, the full force and effect of that uh, regulation. Given that, uh, I still believe that that's the uh, more prudent course of action for the Commission to uh, employ. And as we discussed, we can do it as a guideline first and they, and it, yeah. Yes, yeah. that would be a, a recommended procedure so that the surrounding communities are aware of, of what is going to uh, be anticipated. I just want one quick question. Are you folks here for the duration? Because I've got, I had a different question I want to make sure to get to you. Okay. Depends um, how long the duration is. <laughs> <laughs> if we can make it, you can make it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would be a defined duration. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. We need a reg on that, I think. Um, I, I have a question. Is there, is there any, is there, can we reopen this? Can, can you become a surrounding community after the license has been awarded and we decided we made, the judgment was wrong, but we'd, we'd like to either include you or exclude you, I suppose. Can that be reopened? Yeah, yeah. my recommendation on this is that, um, you know, based on my analysis, and I'd love to have that confirmed by our uh, legal consultants, that after the fact, um, these communities can apply to the Community Mitigation Fund. Um, and well, we don't, that's not the same. The same, can they be a surrounding community and get money from the operator for mitigation? But what, what would there be a substantive impact of them being labeled a surrounding community? The, 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 the value of being a surrounding community is not only that you get the money, but you get a seat at the table at the license application process. Right. right. You, you get the right to be heard on the application, yeah. as does the impact of the entertainment event. And so after the license has been awarded, unless the licensing process is reopened, the utility of being a surrounding community is no different, I think, than being somebody else who's impacted. You you're still can apply to the community mitigation. Process. Yes. But we, don't, but we would rather not, if you're a surrounding community, you, you, you be negotiate a deal up front right. with the, and, you, and the, the mitigation payments or, or transactions are done by the developer. That's right, and and we would we would like them to continue to be done by the de developer, not can, not to use our finite mitigation monies if we can. Right, but but on the on the on the pre and post license award question for designating a surrounding community, the difference uh, is in terms of money is almost immaterial because the the value to of being a surrounding community is you get the right to participate perhaps ask questions <coughs> at the at the licensing hearing I, I understand that yeah. but, okay but there is, isn't there another value of being a surrounding community in that the you could negotiate you, a, you, a, you surrounding negotiate a, a surrounding community I, agreement and the money will come from the operator yeah and if we can if we can reopen and make somebody a surrounding community they then have to they then have to execute a surrounding community agreement the applicant has to execute a surrounding community agreement. It's not a precursor anymore to the license, granted, which is a, which is different. But it would, if if we have the right to do that, I think that would be in the in the commission's interest, particularly. Never mind the community's interest. I, I think we need to, to take a look at the statute, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, on that. I, I don't see in the statute. Well, that's I, what I was asking. Yeah, that's yeah, you know, I don't no. see in the statute. That's any what I was asking. For doing that. Oh, okay. No, I mean, I'm not trying to prolong this conversation, but just one thing I would note is that um, the, the potential of having numerous communities show up at the commission is, it, it's a very, uh, obviously it is, <laughs> it's a huge concern, which is one of the reasons why we've been focus, focusing so much effort at engaging the regional planning agencies to try to identify all of these issues up front. So even if one community does not have surrounding community status for the purposes of this, uh, the application, potentially there might be impacts that could be addressed by the applicant outside of being designated a surrounding community. And that is part of the process that, you know, hopefully with the regional planning agencies we can engage because there'll be likely numerous communities that will be impacted and potentially the applicant could agree to address those without actually falling within the procedures of becoming a surrounding community status. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions, thoughts? 
Um, so I, I think, well, let's, I think we're probably ready to put this to a motion. It seems like there's a pretty strong consensus that, yes, we would agree with the recommendation that we, in fact, I think pretty much to the, to the literal word, we would, we would uh, want to adopt the recommendation as written with the time frame being that we would expand, we would uh, flesh out this list, post it for either informal or formal public comment, and then publish a, a definitive advisory, which will likely go on to become a reg um, by the end of January. Anybody want to move that? So moved. <laughs> Second. Okay. Any further discussion on question number one? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right. I mean, no nays. <laughs> um, okay. Where are we? Question number 17? No, question number two. Um, again, uh, this was my question, and again, I offloaded it on um, uh, Ombudsman Ziemba, but I'm going to suggest that we take a little break. I know you had a question for this commissioner, and, uh, and I wanted to take a quick break anyway. So we'll be back in five minutes.